Johan Rockström, welcome to the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you so much and uh, good morning everyone. So I'd like to give you just an, an overview on the three buckets that we have to keep in mind simultaneously at the talks here in COP27. Bucket number one is what we can call progress. How are we doing there? Well, as we know, that bucket is in a very bad state. We're not making progress. We're following a pathway that takes us to 2.4 to 2.8 degrees Celsius by the end of this century. You know, that is unequivocally, without any hesitation across the entire scientific community, a path to disaster. We haven't been there for the past four million years. We've been around on this planet as modern humans for 250,000 years. We've developed our civilizations over the past 10,000 years, and we're on our way to push the planet at a state which we haven't seen for four million years. It's, it's a completely unacceptable disaster path. So that is the progress level. We have to speed up very rapidly. The second bucket is the bucket on risk. Well, that is, unfortunately, you could argue, just as we're not making progress, we're getting more and more scientific evidence that the risk level is rising because we have more proof today that 1.5 degrees Celsius is not a goal or a target or a political aim. It's a physical boundary. It's a threshold. Go beyond it and we're likely to push very big tipping element systems across their tipping points. The Greenland ice sheet, the West Antarctic ice sheet, all the tropical coral reef systems on planet Earth. You know, the livelihood for over 150 million people and impacting all coastal zone areas in the equatorial band but also abrupt thawing of permafrost in the boreal region of planet Earth. Just the two ice sheets hold 10 meters sea level rise, 10 meters. So at 1.5, we're likely to push the on button of irreversible loss of this 10 meter massive tipping element system that regulates the stability and, and livability of planet Earth. It will not melt overnight, of course, but it would be unstoppable. We would simply drift off in the wrong direction for all centuries to come. So this puts COP27 and, and, and the whole climate agenda in a new level of sharpness. We're not making progress, we're losing 1.5, but we now know more than ever that 1.5 is real. It is something we have to work very hard on to try and aim. So what does this mean then for the third bucket on outcomes? Well, one is, as we said, we know the pathway. We need to cut emissions by half every decade, to have a net zero world economy by 2050, to have any chance of a safe landing. But that will not be enough. Phasing out fossil fuels is, between us, the easy part. The more challenging part is to keep the biosphere intact, to keep the carbon stocks and the carbon sinks in nature still functioning. Nothing less will be required to have a safe landing. That's where the Nor Nordic Pavilion comes in, because I would argue that the only pathway to a safe landing is also a prosperous and equitable and attractive landing. It's a pathway that gives us a more modern um, civilization, which also has better equity, better security, better economic development and better health outcomes. And in the Nordic region, we have come furthest in the world to make proof that the journey towards a fossil fuel free sustainable landing zone for humanity is also a pathway to a more modern attractive society. And this is something which I think has a key attributes from the Nordic countries. It is number one on the innovation path, we have investing in innovation, but also in taking governance seriously. The accountability part, which I think is fundamental and will be very central to the discussions here in, in Sharm el Sheikh. How do we ensure accountability from all countries in the world? And I think the Nordic region has, let's say, put in place the, the most um, advanced, not sufficient, but the most advanced mechanism to be able to, to monitor and account in a serious way the pathways towards that decarbonization future. But there's a final part here, which I think is the most important one, which is to be examples for the world. The Nordic region is, is a respected partner across all the aisles in international cooperation and has to maintain that because we have to have the bridges for acceleration with uh, all countries in the world, but also the big economies in a situation where the geopolitical trust levels in the world isn't at an all-time low. 
So here also, there's almost like a climate diplomacy role for the Nordic countries to really be the bridge makers between those who are kind of locking us in status quo and those who really want to accelerate the pathway towards a safe and prosperous landing. So the risks are high, we're losing the battle, the Nordics can play an unproportionately important role in, in opening up the levers for change. And that's why I think this dialogue is really important. So back to you. Thank you. Uh, I was pleased to, to, to welcome Johan Roxham. I'm even more pleased to welcome the next generation. Nadia Gullestrup Christensen, please take uh, the seat. You are the Danish youth delegate to the UN for Climate and Environment. You're also the EU youth delegate. Welcome. Uh, I, I want to start with you, Nadia, and, and ask, when you, when you listen to what Johan uh, just said, what, what are your first reflections on that? And my microphone's on? No. Uh, yeah. Could we please have uh, Nadia's microphone on as well? Is it... Uh, yeah, it is green. It's yeah. green? It is green. Okay. It should be on. I really like how, you know, I'm supposed to be one of the young people there and then are. it's you who are the technical expert. It's, uh, it's really great. Um, but thank you so much for the really great introduction. I think everyone needs to hear this as a basis for the whole COP27 because it's really important that we keep the science in focus. You know, this is not, you know, just a target or a political goal when we talk exactly. about 1.5 degrees. As you are saying, this is facts and this is something that we need to you know, reach otherwise, as Johan already said, uh, the consequences are huge. Uh, that being said, I think this is also a call to action and really something that we should use to rethink the way status quo is today. And I think this is really something a lot of us young people are really motivated about hearing what you're saying because, you know, Far too often we see young people as, you know, someone out demonstrating and being angry at the older generations, but hearing people like Johan also makes us realize that this is not a fight between generations. There are multiple people who may only be young at heart, uh, who are, you know, with us in, in this, um, and I think that is really motivating. When you, I mean, you sit in on negotiations, so I were very close to it, uh, and when you speak in those for us, for us what, what are you thinking? Is the generation currently in charge on the right track regarding the goals and ambitions? No, they're not. Uh, unfortunately not. Um, and I think in, in general, it's, it can be really frustrating being close to the negotiations because there's so many things not happening and mm. for multiple reasons and for so many things uh, which is really frustrating. And I think that is really also why it's so good that we have us as young people to come here and be a bit impatient because impatient is what we need to be. Um, and I think we as young people can really play a crucial role in highlighting that. And then I think we as young people can also play a role in finding synergies between different disasters because now we're at a climate conference, but this is not, you know, when we talk about the nature in general, this is not just about climate. It's also about biodiversity and the other planetary exactly. boundaries, as you know much more about. And too often we see that the UN system works too much in silos. You know, we're having a UNFCCC and then we have CBD, the biodiversity and the conference that are going to be in December. But, you know, we really need to, you know, think across those areas and find sustainable solutions that are both benefiting biodiversity and climate and, you know, other things as well. Uh, Johan, uh, you and your colleagues have told us repeatedly, and you did it uh, today as well, about the urgency of change. And from, that, uh, from the recent scientific uh, reports, we learned that we were um, very, very far from ever complying with the Paris Agreement long-term goal. But how far are we away from that? Mm. Yeah, no, and so... For a safe landing at 1.5 degrees Celsius, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, estimates, and, and, I, and I also support that finding, that we have roughly 300 billion tons of carbon dioxide mm -hmm. remaining in the global carbon budget. Mm -hmm. That is equivalent to eight, eight years of emissions at, at the current level. So, you know, when, when we in science say that we've entered the decisive decade for having any chance of a, of a safe, equitable landing for humanity, that is based on the latest climate science. So, so we are, 
rapidly losing our chances to hold the 1.5 degrees Celsius mark. As you know, there are even many scientists that today say that it's too late. We, mm -hmm. We've already passed the chance of holding 1.5. The reason for that, which is quite important to recognize, is that air pollution in the world is actually cool, cooling the planet. Mm -hmm. So when you have a smog in New Delhi, um, actually shortening the life for seven to eight million people in the world every year because of air pollution, mm -hmm. that is keeping the temperatures down with something like 0 0.2, 0 0.3 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. So we are at 1.2 today. We might have already a cooling effect of 0 0.3, so we are essentially at 1.5. My assessment, though, is that if we work with removing carbon dioxide with proven technologies, invest in nature to take up even more carbon and, and, and decarbonize according to the scientific pathway, mm. we can still hold 1.5, but it will certainly have an overshoot period. Mm. And the big question is, what will happen then during the overshoot period? Mm. Will we trigger tipping points or will we have them intact? We, d we do not know, to be honest. Mm. But, but, the, but this just shows that we are in a true, true emergency, an urgency point. Mm. Now, if we continue as today, this would mean that already in 10 years' time, we would have committed all future generations to at least moving beyond 1.5 and, and approaching 2 degrees. Mm. And that would very likely mean that we have self-reinforced warming. So, so what the, the biggest fear as a scientist is that we come to a point where it doesn't really help that we get off fossil fuels because methane release, carbon release from soils, carbon release from trees will just self-amplify the warming. It, it won't go super fast, but it will just be a drift very slowly mm. in the wrong direction. Mm. So, you know, we have really all the reason to, to get off fossil fuels now. Mm. Now, there, I, I, listening to, to Johan, uh, at least for me, it's, I think it's easy to be demotivated mm -hmm. when, when you hear about the, the odds we are up against. Uh, but there must be some positive actions that could be scaled up. Uh, are there initiatives that could lead that way, mm. uh, the way you see it? Yeah, and I think, of course, it is Johan's task of being, you know, negative because that is the science. But I think it's still really important that, you know, we as young people are trying to keep being optimistic because this is our future. And if we want to get more people involved, we also need to show what is, you know, what is the good side? What if we do what we need to do? How will the world look? Mm. Having that perspective is really important. And I think some of the issues that you mentioned, such as the health issues, if we're, you know, using that as an example, you know, we can actually save millions of lives if we are transforming to a sustainable way. You know, that would be the, you know, positive story to, to what mm. your Japan just said. And I think that is really important if we are to get people involved who are not already involved. Mm. And, you know, the point about getting more people on board is something that is really important for me because quite often we see that it is a lot of people who look like us who are involved and then we talk with each other and agree and that is good. But, you know, if you're really going to change society, you know, all over the world, then we need people to get involved who are, you know, working in a regular shop, working, selling clothes and things like that they need to to get on board and i think in that regard it's really important to speak in a language that is understandable for people far too often we see that the languages at conferences like cop and and things like that then it's it's really a difficult language and i think that is problematic and of course there's a lot of uh, really positive solutions that you are you know asking about to to also come back to that mm -hmm. and i think the nordic region is also really good at you know promoting them and uh, mm. when we heard your hand talk about, you know, phasing out mm. fossil fuels, then really just, you know, using offshore wind an, as an example, which is a huge technology that started, you know, in Denmark in the Nordic region. And that is really something that we should be proud of and, you know, exemplify to show that it's not just about, you know, avoiding and phasing out things. It's also mm. about, you know, choosing new things and investing in them. Now, you have both uh, highlighted the Nordics uh, and the way we do things and maybe even as role models to the rest of the world, but our consumption. We speak about uh, the re uh, windmills and, and uh, green energy, but our consumption. Mm. How can we live with that and still be role models? Mm. We are creating CO2 footprints, carbon mm -hmm. footprints elsewhere in the world. How can, how, how can we then 
be kind of cocky and, and see ourselves as the, the leaders in this fight. Mm. Nadia? Yeah, you know, to, to be frank, you know, we're not leaders when it comes to that, not at all. An average Dane pollutes seven tons of CO2 per year. That is, that is insane. You know, we would be, you know, totally off if everyone consumed like people in the Nordic countries. So I think that is really something that we should always be really honest about. Also in our home countries, when we talk about us as, you know, being in the forefront, then we always need to remember this, that, you know, our consumption, not in the front, foreign front at all. And I think that is really also something where we as young people can help because a lot of young people are you know changing their habits not everyone but some of us you know are really trying to you know buy more secondhand clothes and share it with your friends and you know starting to get new uh, food habits and things like that where you know just me as an example you know trying to convince my parents to to eat more you know vegetarian and I think that is really where a lot of the action happened that is you know at home with people you know at the dinner table where you can make family you know meet and you know change their habits and consumptions and i think we need to get those conversations started did you succeed with your parents they didn't know you know when i was living at home they thought they got a regular lasagna but then i had a uh, you know a fake lasagna for them and they don't know yet i wouldn't tell you know if they were here <laughs> <laughs> but Johan, yeah. uh, yeah. what, what do you think no, so, so, so I agree, mm. and, and there's a lot of evidence to show that there is no chance of solving the climate crisis only with technological fixes. We also need behavioral change, mm. and you're absolutely right that the Nordic lifestyles are not compatible with a stable, sustainable planet. There's no doubt about that. That said, I, I think it's important to keep these agenda items in the climate negotiations in particular a bit, a bit apart because... Um, the, the key message here is to show that you can have good lives, good nation states, good economic development in a, in a decarbonized pathway. You can, you can really follow a decarbonization pathway. You can have sustainable forestry, sustainable food systems, everything going within the planetary boundaries and still be a modern, successful, equitable society. Because that's what can get India on board. That's what can get Indonesia on board. You know, it, they will never really act on the climate crisis unless they feel that it's a pathway to, to get a better development. It cannot be going backwards. And then we have to load that further with saying that, yes, our, our consumption patterns are unsustainable and we are importing large parts of our footprint. You're right. An average Swede reports to the United Nations five tons per capita per year. That's the official number of the domestic emissions. But the real number is twice that because of our net imports of consumption. But then you could also argue, which the industry does, and I, I, can, I can see a certain validity to that, say, well, but you know, the reason why the Nordic per capita consumption is so unsustainable is that we're consuming coal-driven consumption from, from China. So if we can help China to, to get off mm. coal, then of course the consumption has a lower carbon footprint. That is true, but it won't solve the issue that really matters, which mm. is that our total consumption must go down. Mm. So there, it's a very complex matter, but I wouldn't, you know, it's, it's a bit like a typically Nordic behavior that we are, tend to be a little bit uh, Lutheran and, and masochistic, you know. We're doing good, but still let's pain ourselves. We're not really doing so good, so let's be silent <laughs> because we're really not that good and, and, and uh, we're, we're consuming so much. I would say... Let's be clear on the successes. Let's mm -hmm. be clear on what, what we can see can really give good outcomes. Mm -hmm. The Norwegian electrification of the transport system, mm -hmm. the Danish energy transition, mm -hmm. the Swedish efforts now to really try to get to sustainable agricultural systems. I mean, put those forward and then, yes, have some self-bashing mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. um, needed, mm -hmm. but, but not, not kind of silence our voice. The Swedish, uh, the Sw Sweden just got a new um, government, and uh, the prime minister said that uh, his main goal was to keep uh, everyday life going as it is. So he didn't want to press people to change their behavior. What are your thoughts on, on that approach? Uh, mm. when, when we live in the Nordics and we praise ourselves. Yeah, no, to, to, to oh. me that is a concern. Um, I find that to be quite a, quite a 1990s uh, position. Actually, it reminds me of uh, 
George Bush the elder at the Rio conference saying that the U.S. lifestyle is not up for negotiation, which was a, a real spanner in the wheel on the, on the Rio conference, which, as you know, led up to the birth of the United Nations Framework Convention on mm -hmm. Climate Change and the Agenda 21, claiming today that uh, lifestyles of Swedes are not up for negotiation, I think is not a very constructive pathway to, to really have good collaboration in this transition. And I would say that in Sweden, as I imagine in the Nordics, there is a quite a high degree of recognition today that we have a supply crisis. It's not a demand crisis, it's a supply crisis which is driving inflation and, and, mm. uh, and economy going towards recession because we have a lack of supply of renewable energy. Mm. Putin shuts off the gas pipe and we have a supply crisis. Well, how do you deal with a supply crisis? Well, number one, you invest in new energy systems, solar voltaics mm. and wind and biomass and hydro. And number two, you save energy. You reduce per capita energy consumption. That is a lifestyle change. Mm. And, and uh, I see it in Germany, I see it in Sweden, that citizens in general are willing to turn down their heat at home, to reduce their energy use. I think mm. that is a much more sensible message mm. today that, you know, it's rough times. We have to, um, you know, step up to mm. that situation, not, not say we're just going to use taxpayers' money to subsidize your consumption because we're going to have, we promise you status quo. Mm. I think that's a bit... Um, as I, as I said, it's, it's, it's kind of old-fashioned old environmental. Mm. Uh, I don't know what, what you feel about <laughs> that. But, <laughs> but there, there will be uh, a shift uh, of generation in charge mm -hmm. uh, of policy development and, uh, of course, even the industry. What do you think, Nadia, uh, will be different uh, in the future from today? Uh, so many things will be different and that is also why you know the Swedish Prime Minister is not going to be able to you know keep his promise no matter what because now that climate change is happening people's everyday and lifestyle will change you know whether he wants it or not and then it's just about you know how we want to change it so you know there are some Swedes that are going to be disappointed at some point maybe not in this election term but you know probably in the next um, so, so yeah, I think it's really important that we get more honest policymakers and that we as voters are also, you know, a bit more critical when it comes to that. Mm. Um, but, but there are so many things that, that are to change. And I think, you know, bringing up energy efficiency as example is really good because that is, you know, a thing where it's both something where we need political changes, you know, we need investments and we need public private partnerships to, you know, really scale up, you know, energy efficiency all around society, get better windows, isolations and, and you know, really more things like that. And then we also need people to change habits. And I think this this is really something positive that, that came out of the current horrible crisis. That is that people, you know, all over the world in their everyday lives are, you know, thinking about how to save energy in, in interesting ways. And, you know, also how you can use the energy smarter. It's not just about savings. It's also, you know, about moving your energy, you know, use at, you know, different times. So, you know, when I've been out drinking a beer in the night, then, you know, I'll remember to, you know, wash the clothes when I came home, even though it's two at night, because that's perfect, you know, and, and really finding, you know, new ways and ideas uh, for being a bit more sustainable is, you know, is something that we're all going to do. Not to say that you should all, you know, go out and drink beers and, and then wash your clothes afterwards. There can't be mistakes when you do that. You're speaking into the Nordic Prime Minister's vision 2030 here. You should run for office. <laughs> <laughs> But speaking of the Prime Minister, and, uh, I mean, the, the vision they have set for themselves is to be, uh, for the Nordics to be the sustainable, the most sustainable and integrated uh, region in the world by 2030. And it, it's an ambitious uh, vision. What then should be done to reach that goal, uh, which is um, rather soon, actually? And how can the Nordics take lead on this transition the way you mm. see it, Johan? Yeah. I mean, I would say that the, that, the, that the first step to take where the Nordic countries are in a pool position to take it is to be absolutely clear that this is not only about carbon. It's really about all the planetary boundaries. There, there's no sustainable Nordic region by 2030 unless you also clean up the Baltic Sea, unless you secure that all the boreal forest systems and the reindeer herd in the northern parts of Scandinavia can continue having their pastoral lifestyles that you deal with microplastics, that you deal with all the soil and biodiversity challenges that you have across the entire region. So you have to take care of nitrogen, phosphorus, freshwater, land and biodiversity as well. And I think we 
in the Nordic region, we have, every country has its environmental targets. It's uh, uh, one of the few regions that have been working persistently since the Rio conference in 1992 along this path. So that's number one. Number two is, is the accounting. I mean, that we really need to have accounting on all these parameters so that when, for example, the Swedish parliament has a, taken a decision to have 70% reduction of emissions in the transport sector by 2030, which means a total you know, transition to electric mobility, mm. you have to account for that basically month by month today to be able to show are we making progress. Mm. And I think that would be a wonderful way of the Nordic regions to show that we're putting up a national accounting system that keeps track of this month by one month, but not only on carbon, but on all greenhouse gases, of course, mm. but also on the other environmental parameters that, that form part of that sustainability criteria. Hmm. You want to say something, Nadia? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's really, you know, important with the you know perspective that you're mentioning about, you know, accountability. And I think, you know, first we have learned how to do it with carbon in some way or another, but especially when it comes to things like biodiversity, then it's really difficult for policymakers to figure out how can we measure that? How can you, you know, measure one kind of bird compared to, you know, one whale? And I think that is really also where we need more collaboration between Nordic countries to find, you know, a common measurement for how we can do it and how we can set goals as a region. Also because, you know, the Nordic countries are so small, especially Denmark when it comes to, to you know, geography. So we also need to think across borders, for example, when it comes to protecting the ocean biodiversity then it doesn't make any th sense to have a Danish approach and say now the whale is you know over in our ocean and we'll protect mm. it we need to you know think more together and find solutions where that that works more in in common and across countries and that is really difficult but I think it would be really good if we could have you know more goals together what if we had that you know in the Nordic region should reduce with 80% in in 2030 I think that would be really interesting if we could set goals like that and I know some policymakers would you know be uh, be almost dying when they hear things like that because they want their own goals but i think it's mm. it would be really good if we could have more goals together mm. yeah I give her a hand absolutely the next danish prime minister or something <laughs> but anyway um, imagine then we, we talked about the nordics now but but, but uh, if we broaden the scope um, imagine that world leaders sectors and consumers acted upon what science tells us is needed as of from today, what would be the most important step to take within the closest decade globally to reach climate neutrality by 2050? Mm. Johan? Yeah, I would, I, would put, um, I would put three things on, on, on the table. The number one is to have an immediate decision like COP27 to, to forbid all subsidies to fossil fuels. I mean, to take away the 500 billion US dollars mm. of direct subsidies each year and the 4 trillion US dollars of indirect subsidies each year. So just, just eradicate those immediately. That's number one. Number two is that we need to have a global agreement not to put any more financing into any new fossil fuel infrastructure. This hits Norway, it hits Germany, it hits China, it hits, you know, but, but it, it just, it's just impossible to align with science to have uh, new oil exploration or new coal fire plants which will live for the next 40 years um, and that has to stop immediately. And the third is very simple, put a price on carbon. You know, if you do like the European Union, put a, a hundred euros or US dollars per ton carbon dioxide, you would, I mean, it would go this fast mm. and it would be done. Because immediately, all financial institutions, all banks, all capital will move away from fossil fuels. Because we know that above 50 euros, it simply isn't worth it. And 100 euros is a big benchmark. The social cost of carbon today in science is 200. And we know we'll be moving even higher. The European Union is already at 100. Mm. So, you know, the European Union um, approach to this should be, should be rapidly scaled up across the world. So if you get a price on carbon, stop all investments and get rid of subsidies, I think at least we've taken one step. Mm. Nada, you have a bit on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and when you were mentioning, you know, carbon tax, then I was all, you know, all cheering, you know, like, like the people over there, they heard it as well, mm. um, because that is really what is needed, you know, and of course it would be ideal if we could get, you know, a well, you know, carbon tax, I know is not realistic, but we really need to work on getting it on as high level as possible. And then I think, you know, your question was, how can we reach climate neutrality in 2050? And then I'm thinking, you know, we as a Nordic region, you know, 
talking about those goals we should have together, it shouldn't be 2050. You know, we as a region should be, you know, carbon neutral, you know, much before and also think about our supply chains and having goals for that is really also something that is important talking about the consumption that we had before. Um, so, so really that is something that is important to keep in mind. And then, you know, you're talking a lot about phasing out fossil fuel and really that is you know, top on, on the to-do list also for young people. But then, you know, it, to highlight what needs to be done, then it's also investing more in renewable energy. I think, of course, it, you know, it is something that is already happening in the Nordic region, but especially when it comes to the global south, then it's important to, to remember that because it's not always that the supply chains are there and it's much more, you know, expensive to build uh, renewable energies there because they don't always have, you know, the supply chains mm. and the political will there. So really keep Keeping that in mind and and scaling the build out of renewables all over the world is something that is really important. Mm. We are getting close to, to the end here, but but uh, uh, we have time for a couple of uh, more questions. So I, I would like to ask you also, um, how do you think we have to evolve to to be set for f for the future, if you like? What is what is the next step for mankind? In our program, we have a focus on, on coexistence with nature. Um, is that really realistic? Mm. Well, let, just one, one little, it, it's not a correction, but I just want to, I mean, you're so important and you're sitting in the negotiations and I would, my advice would be actually to, to not say that it's not realistic to have a global price on carbon. I, I as, a, as, a, as an old academic can say that, but not you. <laughs> I think you should stay there and say, nothing is impossible. I mean, we went through a pandemic and we turned things around overnight in a way that we had never expected. I think it's not impossible. Over 40 countries in the world have a price on carbon, too low, mm -hmm. but it's at least uh, Barack Obama had a shadow price on carbon of 40 US dollars when he was in the White House. China has a price on carbon. Uh, I, I think you, you, should be, you should not accept when, because all the adults say all the time it's not realistic and, and I think you should just punch back and say look here we have a crisis here you put a global price on carbon it will have different features in every market around the world of course but, but we need it and science is so clear about that and it would tip the scale so fast so um, I wouldn't just drop that word mm -hmm. Thank <laughs> if, you. if you're okay with that <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but then on, on, on your question on well, we have scientifically been emphasizing this for decades that we have to reconnect the world with planet Earth. That, and this, this sounds like a high level esoteric theory, but it's actually quite frustrating to see how we have allowed ourselves to decouple our economies from, from nature. As if uh, GDP is not entirely dependent on, on sourcing of rare earth metals and mining and, and resources in nature. And it's now hitting back um, I mean, when you think of it, over the last 100 years, it's only in the last 20 years that the planet is starting to send invoices back to, to the economy in, in very big, big invoices. I mean, ten, tens, of, you know, tens of billions of US dollars. That's, the, um, that's Ian in Florida. That's the Pakistan floods. That's the heat wave in Europe. That's the Bangladeshi floods. That's, that's, these are big invoices. So, of course, we need to reconnect to nature and the question is can can that be done in a meaningful explicit way I think the answer is yes um, why well it's also in a way driven by surprising enough perhaps driven by some negatives for example we see more and more concerns around the world on food insecurity mm. this is hitting really hard if you look at the food price index of the FO we've had only three crises over the last hundred years we have the oil crisis, 1974, mm. food prices shot to the roof and was at an all-time high and we had a crisis across the world. The second time was during the Arab Spring. People went out in the streets of Cairo and they had uh, the, the, the manifestations was, was bread, freedom and independence. Bread, freedom, independence. Word number one was bread, which, which means that the food prices at that spike reinforced the Arab Spring. Mm. That's well proven today. And the third spike is right now. And the one we have now is higher than the other two. 
So I think we have like this, this it's, a, it's a bit like a pandemic tipping point of recognizing that, oh my God, fresh water, soils, overuse of pesticides, loss of biodiversity, you know, we're having problems here. Fertilizers, where do the fertilizers come from? They're coming from Ukraine. How, do they, how are they produced? With natural gas. Oh my mm. God, is that how it works? Mm. And without fertilizers, no food. You know, mm. this, this is something that I think is, is starting to sink in. And I think we need to communicate that even, even stronger. Mm. So I think, yes, I think we're moving towards that reconnection to nature. It's going mm. too slow, but I think we're recognizing more and more. I mean, just to give the final data here, you know, 25% of our greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel burning is, is absorbed in terrestrial ecosystems on land. Mm. It's not on agricultural land. It's in the, in the little part of intact nature. It's the 50 or so percent of still intact nature on planet. This is the biggest subsidy to the world economy. Mm. Just nature sucking up mm. ah, one quarter of our climate debt. Mm. You know, that's, that's nature helping us. So mm. I think there is this more and more uh, pathways in that direction. And again, I think the Nordics can play a really important role there because I think culturally, we, we at least have a lot of um, you know, strong connections culturally to, to our, our kind of core ecosystem roots. So I think we should play that card as well. Mm. Here at the Nordic Pavilion, we have this uh, focus on what, what the Nordics would look like uh, by 2050. And um, if we shift to the regenerative, theme, re regenerative thinking, as we have been talking about now, and, and uh, at, uh, of course also practice, Nadia, uh, well, how do the Nordics look like then in, in the future, in 2050? What do you think? I hope uh, and I will demand that we are living in harmony with nature at that point and that we have a really high tax on carbon and that we are also putting a value on nature. Now Johan has talked a lot about, you know, how nature is really helping us, but we're not currently, you know, really valuing how much nature benefits and it's really, you know, it's possible to put, you know, a, a price on it, a price tag, you know, in dollars, you know, how much do we actually get out of nature? And of course, we also need to acknowledge the intrinsic value of nature, but we really need to be more aware of the value of nature in general. So I think that is really something that is important. And then when you talk about, you know, how do I vision 2050, then I really also hope that we are able to share the resources better across the world. Uh, you know, now we're talking about food and bread and, you know, how that is really crucial for people to have it. Mm. But, you know, we, we actually have enough food around the world. It's just getting wasted because a lot of us are not able to, to use it in, in a proper way. And, you know, when, mm. when that is really problematic and we need to find solutions to that where we're sharing resources and, and also in, in generally working more together. And I hope that we can start in the Nordic region showing how we can have more private, private, uh, public, pri private public partners partnerships mm. um, and, and also add people to, to that uh, PPP to make mm. it even more difficult because we, we need those collaborations to find solutions that are not already there. Mm. So, but to be very concrete, if I were to go to Copenhagen or Oslo or Helsinki or, or Stockholm in, in 2050, what will I see then? How will that city or those cities look like? What do you think? You will not see any fossil fuels, not mm. at all. Maybe, you know, a few electric cars and they will be shared between people. Uh, I, I really like that idea, you know, that you, you do not always need to have your own cars or things like that. And not because, you know, you, you don't need to be extremely left wing to have that perspective. We already see companies today like Go More, where you could, you know, on your phone, then just, you know, rent a car or a bike or things like that and I think that is really interesting how we can share more things together in a way where we are also you know saving resources so I hope that that would be something that you would uh, experience. Johan what, what, what uh, do you think you will, we will see in 2015 in, in the capitals and in, in the Nordic countries how would it look like? Well let, let me just um, so I, I, I very much share um, this this um, uh, scenario of a, of a totally fossil fuel free country region but let me just start by by saying that you know there is the dark scenario as well which um, may lead to a situation for example where you know we in the Nordics have felt very uncomfortable when Donald Trump started to build a wall against Mexico but the risk is very large that if we continue as today 
um, we will look back at Trump as being a forerunner for something mm. that has been come natural in Europe because the migration pressure will be so big. Mm. Actually, the latest science shows that up to 3 billion people, 3 billion people will be on the move mm. between 2050 and 2070 just because of heat threatening mm. health in the whole equatorial region on planet Earth because of the warming that is occurring. So, of course, uh, you know, also when you, when you paint a future, you, you are at risk of having massive displacement of people, which makes uh, societies very unstable in the future. So, of course, the desired future is a fossil fuel-free nations in the Nordic region, also with much more investments in green space in general. I think we'll see urban regions, uh, which we already experience, moving towards much more integration of nature in the urban space. I hope we'll also see a much better integration between the rural regions and the urban regions so that there's a kind of a recognition that urbanites are totally dependent on, on, on farmers and forestry and, uh, and marine systems so that there's a much better sense of, of entirety in, in societies. But they have to be healthy, clean, zero carbon and sustainable. There we have it, the vision. Thank you, Johan Rockström and uh, Nadia Gullestrup uh, Christensen for uh, being with us today at this opening talk at the Nordic Pavilion. It has been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.